and infrastructure to code and configuration management, you can tell from my But um, we'll build on a few bits where we touch on different areas and how they are actually very complementary in what you're delivering as an end solution. This is a picture of me. Um, this is kind of my role at the moment, so I'm a DevOps consultant at a cloud company called uh, Heliclouds, delivering AWS solutions largely, but I also work, I work with uh, a hundred of staff and DevOps in, in general. I'm also a GitLab hero, so a GitLab community person. Um, I'm also a Docker community leader, so I'm doing lots of things with containers. Um, I put that an extra developer. I don't know if you can be an extra developer, but the main thing is this. Now I spend very little time developing on Drupal and spend a lot more time developing processes for delivering uh, solutions, whether that's purely in software or in software and infrastructure. Um, and that's my Twitter and my LinkedIn. If you have any questions, then you can certainly throw me some questions on Twitter or LinkedIn. And um, I always like to try and make time for people. So if there's anything that follows up after this that you think I'd really like it, we could go over that at the start, then send me a request on LinkedIn. I'll try and find like half an hour to go over it with you. It's a cool way. Okay, so when we're thinking about continuous integration and delivery, you know, I'm delivering this via GitHub CI, but it's the whole idea of doing process-based iteration for, for the solution management, so that we can automate, build, test, and release software in a uh, stable way, um, that, that we're delivering the tools and techniques back out to software teams from, from general perspective, which really is empowering people to make the right decisions. So I don't think that there is a separation for me in between the limits of where people can write code for. I think if you can write code uh, into Drupal and you can write code into front ends, you can write code that controls what's going to be deploying things and you can write code that's actually going to uh, manage that configuration by pools. I don't think that there is a separation for me in the limits of what we can expect or guide people to write some code for. Now, when I generally do uh, continuous integration and delivery for infrastructure rather than just for, for, for software, we're actually looking at the, the models that we deploy in that and the, the great amount of times you can iterate and integrate the changes to, to working environments, actually you start to find that it reveals a lot of assumptions and errors around how we deploy it um, and should eventually deliver greater speed, stability and security for for what you're doing, whether that is uh, that your estate has some inherent problems in its security, that might be you know, usernames and passwords, API keys, um, that you want to be able to mitigate part of those problems, whether it's that you're delivering onto um, an existing platform that requires some other configuration of API keys. We don't really live in a, certainly in Drupal, for the majority of cases that I've dealt with, with Drupal 8, we're not delivering, you know, as, as Nick suggested in, in the previous uh, keynote, we're not delivering just one Drupal application, but we're actually delivering a range of services that are around the experience that people get. So, what I'll have in the pipeline for that I'm going to be demoing today is this kind of structure that we have, you know, knitting and testing and planning and playing. Um, and then we're going to move to Ansible doing pinning and configuring of our infrastructure. And through all of that, we're attempting to make sure that that's secure. Now, part of the way we're delivering extra security is the fact that actually no one touches um, deployments. So deployments happen entirely in pipelines. And so we have ultimate transparency and visibility. And we can um, iterate on that process to deliver a, a lot greater amount of security. And, and generally, what I am dealing with most of the time is that that's where we're delivering DevSecOps in um, continuous integration um, and, and infrastructure as code is, is through these pipelines to basically start to deliver security at, at every stage. Um, now, when we're dealing with infrastructure as code um, and configuration management, largely we're focusing on these top areas, which is making sure that things are easily reproducible, that things are disposable, that they're consistent, and that change is easy, cheap, and repeatable. The reason I like people to tie it back to what they're, they're doing eventually is that actually when things uh, 
uh, are easily reproducible, they actually become far more exposable. And if they're far more exposable, they have to be consistent in how you're delivering them. And when they're consistent, actually the, the cost of change is easy, cheap, and repeatable. So we're able to run a lot of different environments if we wish to. We can um, build our own workflows in a specific way to configure these services. And we're able to manage the delivery of uh, environments to people through an automated fashion and actually build up the great and greater power for what we're doing. So um, I often kind of pose a question to people of, uh, it's great to know what version of software it's on, but I really want to know what version of your infrastructure is on, because that is half of your solution. When we look at the infrastructure of code, normally I'm breaking this down into two different areas. So we have infrastructure provisioning, um, where we're actually going and requesting infrastructure, and we put in configuration management. So that's largely a breakdown as, as to what we have and how we have it. Um, there's actually some bleed over when we look at the tools that can do this. So um, in infrastructure provisioning, largely that 95% of the work I do is, is infrastructure provisioning and so forth. Um, and configuration management, um, I mainly um, have used Ansible in the past um, and continue to use that, although I'm using Terraform more for the configuration services as well now. Um, but I think that they fit together really well because they are know what they're good at in terms of delivering solutions. So the configuration management piece for Ansible delivery is about managing installation versions and, and the state of the services that you already have. Um, it's going to largely be focused on to, to predefined infrastructure, so the infrastructure that already exists. Although you can use Ansible to build your infrastructure stacks, um, if, if you will, um, it's not for me the ideal location to do it. Um, but it is really good at managing virtual machines, managing clusters, and managing existing software, especially if that software is in a mutable state um, rather than being in a mutable state. So where we're doing mutable infrastructure, really we have the idea that we need some kind of data persistence um, of that, that service. Um, so whether we're um, it actually installing things into the service and controlling it, um, databases, um, you can uh, obviously um, it's a while back that I did this, but not managed large amounts of virtual machines with Google installs on it, um, or different parts of uh, the tool that install that Google work. And when we're looking more at infrastructure provisioning, we're really doing about uh, defining how our infrastructure uh, is established. So that might be setting up how much compute we have, how much storage we have, the network we have, or something as a service, and also the scale of it. Um, and if we're talking about Terraform, we can operate against AWS, GCP, Azure. Um, we can do on-prem solutions so like VMware, Microsoft Network, Cisco. Um, we can also do lots of other locations for uh, these services. And what we're doing is provisioning the kinds of infrastructure that we need that's going to fit with the architecture for the service, uh, the solution that we're dealing with. Now, the great thing that we start to build when we've got software-defined infrastructure is the fact that we can then do versioning on the infrastructure that we have. So as an example, managing scale uh, in an application is interesting, um, especially if you're having to add more nodes on, take nodes away, and being able to understand where you were exactly at a specific version is really important because uh, the hardware that uh, it's actually running on is half of the platform that you're delivering. Um, we can also look at linking that into issue management so that everyone becomes aware of when we'll resolve the bug fixes and how that issue is being uh, resolved in the deployment. We can build change logs for how we're changing the software that's underlying uh, our infrastructure or the infrastructure on top. And we'll, we can build a greater amount of auditability so everyone can see when we're changing our infrastructure and how those changes are likely to affect the application. That runs alongside the idea of having, when you're, you're building uh, infrastructure, that it can be then repeatable and stable and secure and visible. Now, you start to be able to build these in iterative factors, 
but being able to build stability and security and visibility to the overall solution improves the whole team's awareness of what they're delivering as a, as a service. Okay, so if we're thinking about like an infrastructure as kind of life cycle, we have this idea that we're provisioning, uh, configuring, deploying, monitoring, and destroying uh, our infrastructure as code, and then we iterate on that process. So that fits really nicely into kind of doing a, a continuous uh, deployment model because we have this idea that we are continually changing what we're doing. And actually, you find the faster that you're able to iterate, um, the more easily you'll be able to deploy uh, changes uh, to your application, and you'll start to be able to build in those extra features that people want in a, in a much quicker way. Um, core to this is really starting to come across the idea that uh, where we used to think that we were using AWS or, or any cloud provider as an infrastructure as a service provider, you're now not really using it as infrastructure as a service. So it has become another API that has become part of your software solution. So whether it's that it's your putting compute services on there, so you might be requesting the resources for a Kubernetes cluster, so we're an application on. Um, and in that you may also, you, you are going to need to set up networking for it, and how the networking is going to be running, and load balances for it, so you're able to distribute load across your um, cluster, and you may be adding any kind of value-added services, so you may have an idea that we're going to do some uh, email sending through SES or uh, another service, um, or we might be doing something like machine learning with the images that people are putting on there, um, or we might be doing something similar to adding in you know, user authentication with Cognito that we're having to, to scale across a different service. Um, and what we start to be able to do is deliver so solutions that take advantage of the entire state of what we're running. So um, it can be you know, a solution that you're building Maybe you want to use you know, the, the managed uh, document DB for doing something, some kind of service, or you want to use a managed service for doing uh, databases. So you might be running MariaDB um, on an RDS. Um, and what you start to get is a reusability then of those solutions because you're abstracted away from you know clicking on the console in AWS or Google Console, and you're written that down as infrastructure as code. So when you want to we use that solution for another application or to uh, build a, a, a company specific way of delivering um, databases, then you're able to reuse those solutions. And it's really driving towards the idea that, that what you're doing is you're, you're building the cloud as the operating system, and that's going to be delivering all the services that you need to deliver the experiences that you want. So whether that's, you know, you might be putting in Swift uh, DynamoDB or Elasticsearch, um, you might be storing things in S3 and then looking at delivering them for a CDN somewhere. Um, we might be looking at um, that we've got to do a direct connection to something that's on-prem with what you're running. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, linking in our solutions to having CloudWatch and CloudTrail, essentially, so that we're able to effectively do monitoring on our service and do uh, logging on our service, and that gives us the ability to then make decisions with regards to what we have. Um, and you might be looking at doing some, some additional machine learning, or some business intelligence, uh, or doing something with, with Redshift, where we're doing kind of putting our item into a data lake. So what I'm trying to suggest that is that when we've moved across the barrier of understanding that we're delivering a solution with a set of infrastructure as code, um, and that that's going to be then deployed with Terraform and configured with Ansible, we can actually start to move that to be a lot more of an entire solution for what people are wanting with their, their applications. Rather than being a, a single idea of a solution, we're delivering everything together um, and we can put in you know, compute, we can put in other functions to, to operate alongside this so we can add in extra areas as our solutions evolve and really as Drupal evolves as a platform going forwards 
um, whether you're delivering that in a federated search or you're delivering uh, multi site capabilities um, with access to multiple services. Okay, so I wanted to, to, to shift quickly to, to a demo so that people can actually see this uh, in, 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 in real life, um, which I think is, is really important to try and uh, solidify some of these principles. So, what I've got here, um, I think people should be able to see it. And uh, I think that this should be large enough that people can see, but I can make it slightly larger if that's required. It's fine. It's okay. Okay, so what we have in here, I've got a, um, a if we imagine it's like a single solution um, that we've got in here, um, and you can see that I've got GitLab CI. So my GitLab CI is set up to run through a different set of stages, um, just like the ones that I showed in the slide. So we've got a lib, a test, a plasma, a fly, thing, configure, and destroy. Um, and we've got different parts of that process. So we've got a YAML link across our service. We want to make sure that our uh, YAML is correct inside both GitLab and inside the playbooks that we've written. Um, I'm doing formatting check of the Terraform. I'm doing validation of Terraform. And then building a plan of, of Terraform, so that what we're using, and doing an apply stage, um, and putting in a private key, so that we're able to, to do some extra bits. Um, then running a ping with Ansible, and then doing a configure with Ansible um, for the services that we're wanting to install. So this example, I'm doing um, running Ansible, I'm connecting to it, I'm doing a bang and break the uh, instance that already exists, um, and then I'm ins installing Vault as a server uh, on top of this. Um, and that's through this playbook. And the last stage is a, a destroyer stage. So you see some areas in here where I'm putting in the environment variables. There is obviously my end risk key going into here. And you can also see that I'm using TFC credentials. And this is because I'm using Terraform Cloud as a state storage for my um, Terraform state. I would recommend that you use this uh, if you don't already um, use, use state storage. Uh, Telecom Cloud at the moment is free for the personal use, um, which is, is what I'm doing as demo under. Um, and you get that whole bunch of being able to use Terraform and you get nothing with it. Um, you could set this up with S3 and with DynamoDB if you wanted to and control that solution, but at the moment I don't need to control that solution. Um, and we're running to turn on for it. And we also see that we've got this private key. So what I wanted to suggest that is you know, um, inside our setup of the telephone I'm making, and we'll see that the private key being used shortly, we've got um, these things that are, are providers. So this is like the libraries that telephone knows it, it needs to pull down. So we've got the AWS library, and we've actually got a null library as well, which I'll come to shortly. And we're building resources inside AWS. So for anyone who builds this normally, you've got you know, a VPC, we've got an internet gateway, we've got a route, um, we've got a subnet, we've got then a security group, um, so that we're allowing port 22 from anywhere. That's not a good idea if it's not a demo. Um, we've then got a security group that's allowing port 80 and port 443, um, and a security group uh, that's allowing external access. And then we've set it up an AWS instance, so that's like an EC2 instance. Um, we put in, in a specific AI of the instance type, and we put it on the subnet with security groups, and this is making an elastic IP. So what you get from this is you get a single EC2 instance on its own VPC with its own subnets and its own security groups entirely isolated from anything else in your uh, AWS account. Um, and at the end, it's going to give you an uh, elastic IP. The output of this would be the Elastic IP, uh, IP address, and it tells you the name. Um, and then we can see from using the provisioner, which is what we're starting to um, segue into using Ansible with, the provisioner is then going to say, well, echo out this IP address as a dot inventory file on the local uh, thing that we're running, and SSH into um, the instance that I create. Um, which is going to be under this host and install Python 3. Now, this is obviously a requirement for running Ansible that Python is installed. That's really the only requirement that Ansible has, um, mainly um, running Python 3 as well. 
and which it should be read. So we're logging in to, after we create this infrastructure, it logs into it using the terraform and installs Python 3. Um, and at the end of that, it will give an output of this inventory file. And what the inventory file then is it, it stores that uh, inside an artifact and makes it available to the next stage, which is the PIM stage, which then uses Ansible. Uh, so we're using an Ansible Docker container. Um, you should use this one as well. I think I've got about 3 million users. You can pull this, this container. Um, so we're running an Ansible flavor with the user Ubuntu. Use this inventory file and then the, the, the table that says ping, and this ping is just doing that and all the uh, item. Okay, so I switch back to the uh, And what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you what this then looks like inside GitHub CI. So um, we can see that I've added some roles here, and we can see the total pipeline as I deploy it. So we have in here that we're doing format checking, we're doing CF linting, we're doing gamma linting, um, we're violating it. Um, but the, the, the interesting things start happening in plan. So we can see in the plan um, that what we're doing is we, we create a plan and this is going to tell us that our execution plan, because it's using this null resource, because I need to ping out the inventory every single time um, at the moment, but I, I couldn't work out the moment. But, um, so it's going to create the inventory file every time and then it's going to store that uh, as what we are going to run in the next stage. And as we move to the next stage, which actually applies that plan, which is, if you imagine, it's going to change that uh, deployment that we've got, um, it actually goes and creates this. Now you can see that previously um, we've already set everything up, so it knows there's only one thing it needs to change, um, and that's in no significant change, it just goes in and says, it's all like three, oh, you've already installed like three for this. Um, and then we make that change to the CLI IP address here. And as we move to the stage after this, so this is set up our EC2 instance, install Python 3 our EC2 instance, and then we're able to run our ping on the next item in this in this stage, which is actually running Ansible Playbook, that does a ping and says, okay, you ping this uh, brilliant. And we can then say, well, Ansible is now working properly against our instance, so I can go and configure that instance if I wish to, um, and I can go configure, and it's going to go and run this update upgrade one, which is going to say we're going to upgrade the thing. And actually, if I've run this already, it just says, okay, um, you don't actually need to do this. So what we can see from here is we've got this idea of running a pipeline that is now Requesting our infrastructure, setting up our infrastructure, uh, giving us access to run Ansible on that infrastructure, running Ansible on that infrastructure so we can be configuring our service. So I'm just going to commit this. In, uh, so we can see it running through that again. Um, now, what would happen is you've seen that that was just a git push that we've done to this repository and inside that it's run into uh, GitLab CI so that we then restart in this entire process and because there's not going to be a significant amount of change it, it completes about four, four and a half minutes. Um, and what we're doing is we've managed to turn this solution process as in this should be now deploying Vault as a service onto the virtual machine. Um, is entirely isolated from anyone actually touching it. So I can see I've logged into nothing, and what we're actually able to do, oh, I've got it, brilliant. Um, this one.
but it's around doing a similar, a similar job um, with uh, a lambda function. And the reason I want to see this is to, to show you this is that this is not then uh, isolated to how you are able to deploy multiple solutions. So in this solution, we've got you know, a lambda function and some Terraform, and we've got a Docker file, so we actually are storing a container for everything we do. Um, and you will be able to see inside the Terraform that we're running, um, I'm actually running three different versions of this Lambda service at the same time. Now, what you can imagine in uh, a Drupal-specific uh, idea is that you could then be running multiple or not uh, Drupal environments um, with the entire service running um, and run them in an entirely hands-off way of running the entire like, all your infrastructure. So if you've got multiple infrastructure factors together, you can run it with that. Maybe you're running part of your service through uh, a hosted platform, and that could be absolutely fine as well. Maybe you're needing to, to run different databases or a different setup of, of items, and that's also fine. So you can look at configuring all of these services together to give us an overall solution. So this is running three different ones, and it runs entirely through the pipeline. So we are running this pipeline, which is obviously a Lambda function, but in, in a, a very, very similar way where we're, through our pipeline, we're able to see that we're doing a similar jobs. We're doing minting, we're doing validating. This part is packaging up and putting, creating containers from the software that we've made. We're then planning and applying and deploying those containers onto our infrastructure. And we have the option to destroy it afterwards. The, the core areas of this that I'm trying to explain is that we are moving towards a world where GitOps is not something that's isolated to uh, just deploying platforms to Kubernetes, but it's something that you're able to do to configure an entire service and a collection of services together, providing that you have the correct API keys and that you're able to deliver security into these containers whether well, that's through um, Vault, which is a, actually, in your opinion, Vault is the best secret management service, um, and that's what we should use. If you want, also my opinion on the best way to do infrastructure provisioning, that's terrible. Um, and I think and my, my preferred way of doing configuration management is Ansible, um, because I think it's easier to understand than, than share or Bucket. But um, that's still uh, up, for, up for debate, you can um, do things in different ways. Okay, so I'm going to shift back to the previous project. Hopefully, we've got some work to be done. So we can see our pipeline is running. We've got our ping. It's still going to be running properly. Um, and you should be able to also see that we're deploying these things in, in five or six minutes, and we're not having to watch them. So I'm not only deploying things I know are going to actually work which gives you additional benefits at the end. Yeah. And this is going to get to, to the point of concrete here. So I'll drop back into the presentation so that, that people can see what I've done. I've made both of these projects public. Uh, unfortunately, I will have to destroy the infrastructure for it, so I will, after we've done this, I uh, actually know the second one could stay up and this first one will have to be destroyed again. Uh, that, that the company policy. But you can take this and you can, provided you put the right credentials in, um, as in you need AWS credentials and you would need um, a way of configuring your um, backend for the Terraform um, and putting your private key in, because you can go and use this today to go and deploy and store to whatever size of virtual machines you want. You may need to find a different way of echoing out inventory files, but it will work absolutely fine for putting this entirely inside uh, GitHub CI. And we're actually moving to having GitOps then for whatever you want to do, uh, not just limited to, to Kubernetes or what it is. So the aim of this has been to try and think about how we can do the solution to, uh, deployments for, for deployable objects. So really what we're trying driving towards is that we may now have a deployable object that has everything in it um, and we can package it up so we can keep deploying this, you know, if we needed to deploy it to a different cloud platform, 
you need to live by one breath, then you get to smooth the jump to be able to do that. And we've seen that our earlier updates as software defined infrastructure, but we're actually moving towards software defined solutions that have everything inside it that has the versioning that we're running. You may be running versions of versions um, in, a, in a great way, but you may need now uh, another tool to understand which version your infrastructure is on, which version your backend is on, which version your database is on, which version your services are on, which version your uh, Drupal site is on. Um, and we're able to put this then into centralized issue management and run change logs across those applications, giving it all some portability, which then we start to be able to build solutions that are much more repeatable, stable, and secure, and visible, and actually start to deliver a lot greater value to end customers, but also build in reusability and extra tools for people to use for the next time you're asked to make a, a, a change similar to, to this. And really, that starts to play into this idea that we are using now infrastructure as code configuration management and the software applications that we're running to operate the cloud as an operating system. There is no distinction, at least there's no distinction in, in my eyes, between the software that we're running on infrastructure and the configuration and provisioning of the infrastructure that we want. And having that idea of separation, I think, is going to limit what you're able to do in the future of software delivery. And it is, this is only going to become greater as people connect in further services to drive that greater experience and also the greater ability to scale the services up or down. The last thing I'll probably leave people with is um, kind of a, that people's cloud journeys is, is, is already happening um, and it's trying to find the values that are going to give you the most you know, innovation, cyber time, agility, security, compliance. Um, and then it's about building the right teams and selecting the right tools. Now, I think at the moment for the way Drupal is as an application, that using Terraform and Ansible um, is an ideal way of being able to deliver that. Um, and it will deliver a great amount of DevOps maturity that will end up delivering time and value back to people uh, in, in a quicker aspect and be able to accelerate that, that process. I'm going to quickly segue to see if we did the deploy goals or want to close out. I'm going to say no, failed. It failed because it didn't install. So, yeah, Vault has gone and been installed using branch analysis uh, item inside uh, the instance and it's unfortunately failed on the ability to run multiple hosts because we're not running this in an enterprise system. But what I'd like to say in, in going forward is that that um, is, is, is uh, an ideal way of being able to accelerate your journey forwards. Does anyone have any questions? If you have any questions and you don't uh, think of them now, or if people, I guess, uh, see this in the future, you can look at me or find me on LinkedIn, um, and I can certainly look at uh, helping people with answering those questions. And if there's more that you want from me, then I can uh, make a uh, meeting or something. I'm seeing stone silence, which is either a really good thing or a really bad thing. I've where I've still got my Drupal t-shirt on, and I've also got my Drupal Con London or Drupal Con Croydon uh, mug. This one's not, not working yet, I think I'm doing well. We're doing eight years old. Good. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Ralph.